Good morning. Glad to come and uh, worship with you today and to bring to you God's Word. I invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 20. We'll be looking at verses 24 through 31. Listen to the reading of God's Word. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print, uh, print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands. Reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen... Uh, me you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word, inspired by your Holy Spirit, all about your uh, grace to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Today, Lord, we want to see Jesus. So open our eyes. Open the eyes of our understanding. Give us your wisdom by your Spirit that we could see Jesus and worship Him. That His life, His resurrection life, would transform us into His image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we come to the end of John chapter 20, we come really to the very purpose of the Gospel of John. You know... Most Bible scholars and commentators and preachers agree that as we come to the end of chapter 20, to Thomas's confession, to the words that follow it, where Thomas confesses, my Lord and my God, that we have come really to the pinnacle of the testimonials of Jesus Christ. No other disciple in the gospel exalts Jesus with a loftier confession of faith than does Thomas right here. My Lord and my God, he says. Now, if you remember, as we've studied through the Gospel of John, you'll remember that John kind of bookends his Gospel with statements about the deity of Jesus Christ. Remember, at the very beginning of John, in his prologue, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he said. And so we have... Jesus being declared as God in the very beginning of the Gospel of John. It's what John is going to show us. It's what he's going to prove to us. It's what all of the evidence and all of the words and all of the teachings of Jesus and all of the miracles of Jesus, all of the signs that he did, it's all to point to, uh, to proving that Jesus is God. And not just the Son of God, but He is also the Son of God who came and lived among us. As He said in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John began his gospel by saying Jesus is God. 
Now he ends the gospel as well with a confession by Thomas that says, My Lord and my God. And everything in between has been John giving us convincing evidence that Jesus is this one that he's proclaiming him to be for the purpose that we would believe in him. That's what he says in verses 30 and 31, isn't it? In many things, you know, that uh, he could have written, but he says in verse 31, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is, as we come to here, at the end of chapter 20, it's really the climax of the whole gospel. Of course, this is not the end of the gospel of John, uh, but it is, I believe, the climax. We still will have John chapter 21 to go here, and uh, we'll be spending some time there in, in the next couple weeks. But... John 21, the last chapter, is kind of like the denouement of, of, the, uh, of the story. It, uh, it comes after the climax, and it kind of ties all the loose ends together. Uh, it's kind of like a mopping up and clearing up of some conflicts that were there in the narrative. But the climax has already come. We have seen that the climax of John's gospel is, is Jesus and his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, and then his appearances to uh, the disciples here. And that includes Thomas's conclusive testimony that Jesus is God, my Lord and my God. Now, one of the things we have to remember about John's gospel is that John is very selective in the events and the teachings that he includes in his gospel. Uh, we've seen this all along. Much that we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in their uh, accounts of Jesus' life and ministry, we don't have in the gospel of John. Uh, John is very selective in what he chooses to put in. In fact, if you read through the Gospel of John and you're careful to count up the number of days that Jesus is, uh, of the events that Jesus uh, does, that John records in his Gospel, John really only records events that happen on about 22 different days. Out of three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he records about three weeks of Jesus' ministry. And so think about, you know, all of the all, all of the thousands of miracles that Jesus must have done. You know, there are times when Matthew, Mark uh, records that, that uh, Jesus was in a city, in a village, and he healed everyone who was sick. They don't tell us all their names. They don't tell us all their diseases. But he just says, just plainly, he did it. You think of all of the thousands of miracles that Jesus did, the unnumbered teachings and sermons and, and times that he preached to the people, the, the intimate conversations that Jesus must have had with his disciples as they walked along the road or as they lay down to sleep at night. They're... And, and all the things that John must have witnessed and had heard from others. In fact, John tells us, you know, himself that he purposely has chosen certain things to put in his gospel for a reason. Isn't that what it says in verse 30 and 31? Look at it again down there. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, John has recorded for us some signs, right? We had the sign. His first sign that John records for us was the turning of water into wine, John chapter 2, right? Then we had him healing uh, the, the uh, 
official's son that we have in John chapter 4. We had the healing at the, at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. We had in John chapter 6 the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water. Uh, and then in John chapter uh, 9, we had uh, Jesus um, raising, or, or John chapter 9, I'm sorry, Jesus uh, healing a man who had been born blind, right? Uh, and then in John chapter 11, we had Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. That's 6. Well, 7 if you split up uh, the feeding of 5,000 and the walking on the water. I, I kind of count those two as one. Because uh, so, they're in the same chapter, just for the fun of it. But the seventh one, I believe, the greatest sign that he does is his resurrection from the dead. That's the miracle. That's the seventh sign. In fact, in John chapter 2, Jesus specifically tells uh, the, the Pharisees and the chief priests who ask him for a sign of, of the authority that he does these things of driving the, the people who are buying and selling out of the temple. They ask him for a sign. He says, no sign. He says, the sign is this. He said, destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. And he was speaking about the temple of his body. The seventh sign, the greatest sign, the sign that really shows that he is Lord is his resurrection from the dead. And so he says, Jesus did a lot of other signs that are not recorded. But he said, I wrote these down, right? Verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. And so John wrote this for a purpose. The purpose is that we would believe in Jesus Christ and having believed, God will give us that gift of eternal life. Now, this is the purpose for which John writes. In a sermon on these verses, Charles Haddon Spurgeon pointed out that John really sticks faithfully to his purpose. You know, he omits... A lot of stories about Jesus, uh, even stories that John was included in that might have shown John in a, in a good light, you know, like John was one of the three that Jesus took further with him in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed. John was one of the three that Jesus took on with him to the Mount of Transfiguration where he, he's, his clothing became white and shining and he saw, they saw him in his glory and Moses and Elijah were there speaking with him about his departure that he would accomplish in Jerusalem when he went to the cross. But John admits those things. He doesn't tell us about those things. Instead, he tells us especially a series of testimonies of people who were led to believe in Jesus Christ. It started back in chapter 1. In chapter 1, after John the Baptist declares Jesus and uh, sees him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, there are a couple disciples that hear him say that. We think, uh, well, we know one of them was, was Andrew. One of them, the other one uh, might have uh, been uh, John himself. But these disciples hear him say that, and immediately Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter. And he, and he exclaims, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And then Philip, when he hears, he goes and finds Nathaniel, and he announces, we have found him, of whom the Moses and the law and the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel, when he meets Jesus, he confesses, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And so it goes through the Gospel of John. In John chapter 3, we have, we have the testimony of Nicodemus who says, no one has, it, we, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one is able to do the signs that you do unless God were with him. We see the testimony in chapter 4 of the Samaritan woman who goes and tells her neighbors that he told me everything I ever did, and then the Samaritans come out, and they, they declare that Jesus is the Savior of the world. 
And so we have testimony after testimony after testimony in the Gospel of John declaring who Jesus is. In John chapter 6, verse 69, Simon Peter declares, We have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of God, or the Holy One of God. And now, after Jesus' glorious resurrection, John presents a definitive testimony and it's the testimony of Thomas. And, and you think about that because that means that the Apostle John, sitting down and writing this gospel so that people would believe in Jesus, considering all the things that Jesus did and said, thinking of all the encounters he had had with Jesus, others had had with Jesus, all the things that people had said about Jesus, John chose the Lord's encounter with Thomas as the high point of his gospel witness. Why? Why Thomas? You know, the Apostle Thomas, I think, has gotten a, a bad reputation, you know, in the church over many centuries. We call him what? Doubting Thomas, right? Right? We think of him as a skeptic or as a pessimist. We, you know, we, but really, you know, like most of the apostles, uh, we don't vote, know very much about Thomas. Um, the name Thomas comes from the Hebrew word for twin. In fact, uh, three times in the Gospel of John, uh, John calls him Thomas, also called Didymus. Didymus is the Greek word for twin. And so it's possible that Thomas was a twin. He had a twin. We don't know who the twin was. Uh, some think it could have been Matthew. Because in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke, when uh, the only place where Thomas is, is mentioned in those Gospels, of course, is in the list of the twelve, uh, the twelve apostles that Jesus chooses. And in those three lists you find that Thomas is always paired with Matthew. Uh, you have pairings, like you have Peter and Andrew, brothers. You have James and John, brothers. You have, you have Thomas and Matthew. But uh, in the book of Acts, Thomas is paired with Philip, so we don't know. <laughs> okay, uh, It's just a guess. But everything else we know about Thomas comes from the Gospel of John. In, in uh, John chapter 11, verse 16, you remember when uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus is sick. And they have sent word to him telling him you know, that his friend is sick. Jesus stayed where he was for four more days. Uh, finally, Jesus says, uh, we're, we're going to go to, to uh, Judea. And, uh, and see Lazarus uh, that I might, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just, because he's asleep, he's, Jesus says, I'm going to wake him up. And they, then the disciples say, well, you know, if he's sleeping, maybe he'll just get better. Uh, Jesus says, wait a minute, you don't understand, he's dead. And, uh, and I'm going there, you know, as he says, I'm glad I was, you, uh, I wasn't there when it happened so that you may believe. And Jesus is determined to go back to Judea, even though the Jews were just recently trying to stone Jesus to death there in Judea. And Thomas speaks up, finally, after he knows there's no turning Jesus away from going back to that dangerous place of Judea. Thomas says, well, let us go also that we may die with him. May sound a little pessimistic, I suppose, but at least Thomas was loyal, right? He's, he's ready to just go and die with Jesus, right? Thomas speaks up again uh, in John chapter 14. In the upper room, after Jesus has told the disciples that he was going away to his father, in John chapter 14, uh, 
Jesus says, and where I go, you know, and the way, you know. And Thomas complains in verse 5. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? To which Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And now we have this third uh, time where we find Thomas. John chapter 20. And this episode, of course, uh, John tells us, takes place eight days, that's one week, after Jesus had suddenly appeared behind closed doors on the evening of the resurrection uh, to his disciples. And, and so it's one week later, it's the next Sunday. Jesus has already, to the other disciples, had shown them his hands, where the nails had gone, his side, where the spear had pierced him. He proved to them that he was alive from the dead. But John 20, 24 tells us, Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so John makes a point of telling us that Thomas uh, not only wasn't there, but he also tells us Thomas was one of the twelve. Now we know that from the other Gospels because they give us lists of the twelve. But this is the only time here in the Gospel of John that, that it's mentioned that Thomas is one of the twelve. And I think that's important. It's important because this group, the twelve, were designated by Jesus as apostles. The word apostle means one who is sent. And you remember that when Jesus met the other disciples the week before, we had looked at this last week in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. When Jesus met the rest of the disciples that evening, what he, had he done? He had not only shown them proof that he was alive, but he had commissioned them. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. He sent them as apostles. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He told them the message that they were to give, the forgiveness that they were to go out and proclaim the forgiveness of sins. And so he has done this for the apostles, except Thomas wasn't there. He was supposed to be. He's an apostle, right? And all the others were already eyewitnesses. In fact, one of the requirements that you find in the book of Acts for an apostle when they go about trying to replace Judas, who, of course, had went out and hung himself after he betrayed Jesus, they were looking to replace Judas. And the requirement, one of the requirements was that the person needed to have been with them and seen Jesus' ministry and been a witness, an eyewitness of his resurrection had seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, when he is speaking about the resurrection in, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15, uh, he, he mentions uh, that he had seen the Lord Jesus. That's his qualification as an apostle. You know, he, he says, last of all, he appeared to me also as to one untimely born. See, he didn't see Jesus when the others saw him. He saw him much later. But he was qualified to be an apostle because he had seen the risen Lord. It blinded him, but he saw him, right? And so uh, this is the requirement, and Thomas wasn't there. Now, Thomas didn't necessarily need to see the risen Christ to be a believer, but he did need to see him to be an apostle. And what had happened that week before, you know, when, when Thomas was missing, that was that Jesus had commissioned those apostles. And so because Thomas wasn't there, he missed it. He missed the blessing and he missed the sending. Now someone has said that you never know what you're going to miss if you don't come to church. Um... 
You know, as Christians, um, unbelief and weak faith, they're a danger for all of us. Um, That's why the author of Hebrews says, in that passage that Brett read earlier, he talks about our great need to meet together and to encourage one another and to strengthen each other in the faith. In Hebrews uh, 3.12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But he says, here's what to do. Exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through, uh, through deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Listen, we need each other to fight sin, to pursue holiness, to stay on that narrow road of faith. We need one another. Again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, he writes, Let us hold fast the confession of our faith, or the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And listen to this, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So is it wrong to miss a church gathering? No, not necessarily. Sometimes there are good reasons why uh, you cannot come. Uh, you're sick, or in, uh, in the case, what we have with the pandemic, you're afraid of getting sick. Uh, and there are, there are good reasons for that. But we also need to think about this. Uh, can missing a church gathering be detrimental to your faith? Absolutely. Especially if you miss a lot. <laughs> okay. Thomas missed one Sunday and he found himself exactly where the author of Hebrews says that we need to stay away from. Falling into the posture of an unbelieving heart. And so we see the unbelief in Thomas' heart in his reaction to the disciples when the disciples say, we have seen the Lord. Verse 25, right? And how does Thomas react? He says... Well, unless I see the print of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, according to J.I. Packer, Thomas was guilty of what he calls willful skepticism. You know, there's... There's no sense in which Thomas's words express any hope that his fellow disciples are right. He refuses to listen to the word of the other apostles, the apostles' witness. And, and he places this undue burden on Jesus himself. To show up and prove it to him. But here's the good news. The Lord doesn't leave Thomas in that sad state of unbelief. So in verse 26, it says, And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And so as I said, eight days later means that next Sunday. So on the next Lord's Day, the, the disciples are, are huddled up together again in this, this room with the doors all shut. And this time Thomas is with them. And just like last week, the Lord suddenly, miraculously appears in the room before them. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth are what? Thomas, you knucklehead! No, 
What was it? Peace to you. Peace to you. And after this, without a word from Thomas, Jesus, knowing Thomas's heart better than Thomas knew it himself, he says to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now, Jesus could have rebuked Thomas. He could have condemned his unbelieving heart. But instead, he just speaks peace and he displays grace. Jesus meets and he ministers to Thomas right in his weakness. You know, Jesus' actions here remind me of what Jude writes in verse 22 of his little letter. Jude, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who once himself doubted that Jesus was the Son of God. Jude says to us, have mercy on some who are doubting. And praise God, that's what Jesus does with Thomas, right? You know, and I know if you're normal, listen, if you're normal, you have struggled with doubt, with unbelief from not, not always, but from time to time. And I know that, you know, really, if you think about it, every time you sin, it's an expression of unbelief. Because when we fall into sin, we do so because we believe, we, we, we don't believe God's word. We don't believe that Jesus and, and obeying him and obeying his commands and obeying his and, and just loving him first, we don't believe that that's what we want. We don't believe that's what's best for us. We think our sin is more important. And so we're all doubters in our flesh. But listen, Jesus is gracious like he was to Thomas. Instead of judgment, he gives peace. Instead of condemnation, he gives resurrection proof. He gives the gospel. He gives himself that's what he does for Thomas, and that's what he does for people today. And that brings us to Thomas's response in verse 28. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now Jesus, as, as he reveals himself to Thomas, he told him, Put your hand here, put your finger here, put your hand here. But did you notice that John does not record that Thomas did that? John doesn't tell us that Thomas touched Jesus, even though Jesus invited him to do so. We don't know whether he touched him or not. I'm inclined to think that Thomas didn't need to touch him. Since Jesus replied, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Or it could be a question, because you have seen me, have you believed? <laughs> it's not so much a rebuke to Thomas, but it's meant to underline, to underscore the importance of believing here. Of not seeing, but believing. You know, at that point, Thomas didn't need to touch Jesus because he believed and he knew that Jesus was really alive. Thomas had said, I will never believe unless I touch his wounds. But God proved him wrong. 
And listen, God still proves us wrong. In our unbelief, in our sin, He shows Himself to be gracious, to be merciful, to be mighty to save, to be faithful again and again and again. He who called you is faithful and He will do it. You remember... um, We said that John began his gospel by declaring Jesus to be God. And now, at the end of his gospel, Thomas declares him to be God, my Lord and my God. As we said in John 1.14, John had written, The Word became flesh, this Word who was God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Thomas has beheld the glory of Christ. A glory that's full of grace. A glory that's full of truth. And he can't help himself now. He just cries out in exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, in worshiping Him, and he confesses, My Lord and my God. Whatever doubts, whatever concerns, whatever frustrations, whatever anger, whatever unbelief, whatever it was that was on Thomas's mind for those eight days when he said, I would not believe, it's all gone now because... All that he can see is the glory of Jesus Christ. Thomas knows that he's at peace with God because he's standing, God himself is standing before him and giving him grace and speaking to him peace. Well, what about us? Maybe you're thinking, you know, if I could have been there with Thomas and seen Jesus raised from the dead, it would be easier for me to overcome my doubts. But I've never seen him. For you, Jesus speaks the last words to Thomas in verse 29. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Listen, that's us, right? What a blessing. Jesus pronounces a blessing on those who believe because of the apostolic witness, because Thomas goes out and bears witness, because John goes out and bears witness and writes it down in the Scriptures, because Matthew and Mark and Luke and all of the the New Testament writers write it down because we have the proof in the Word of God and we believe that truth. We are blessed, he says. Peter writes about us who believe in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8 he says whom having not to speaking about Jesus he says whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls listen that's how we get saved by believing in Jesus Christ based on the witness of the Word of God. That's why he says in verse 31, these are written so that you may believe. What a blessing it is to believe in Jesus. Not because we've seen Him, but because we have His written Word commenting on faith that comes from God's Word, Calvin writes, We now behold Christ in the Gospel in the same manner as if He were visibly standing before us. You know, salvation doesn't come through some mystical or miraculous vision that you have of the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes 
from the Holy Spirit giving you understanding and insight into God's Word so that you are given the gift of faith by our Lord and you believe in Him because of what He has written. We have eternal life when we believe in the Word of God that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins on the cross, was raised from the dead on the third day, and is Lord and God. That is what we proclaim as we come to the Lord's table today. Jesus died for our sins. The blood of His death washes away our sin. He is the living Lord who gives eternal life because He was raised from the dead on the third day. He is our Lord and God who died for us and lives and is coming again. That's why we sing things like crown Him with many crowns, the Lamb upon His throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for me and praise him as thy matchless king throughout eternity. The last verse of that song says, Crown him the Lord of love who behold his hands inside those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail through all eternity. Let's stand together as we pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come to your table today, God, we ask that you would do a work in our hearts through your Son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit. Look deeply at us, God, and let us be open and honest with you so that your Word and your table might mean everything to us because we've seen Jesus. God, do that work in us now and prepare us to receive these elements, the cup and the bread, remembering what Jesus Christ has done for us and worshiping Him as my Lord and my God. Amen.